Right. Welcome, everyone, to uh, the second episode of my podcast. Still has no name. Uh, I will come up with one. Uh, but I'm very excited today because I have my very first guest, uh, Joe Jeffries, who's agreed to be on. Uh, thank you very much for that. I've had lots of people in mind. Uh, Joe's the first guy that I've got on. I've got uh, a lot of questions to ask him, and uh, he's, he's really an interesting chap. Joe is uh, the founder and uh, lead coach of uh, JJ Physiques. Um, he also runs a very successful podcast, OPD podcast. I was there the last episode, so please do check that out if you get a chance. Um, so, welcome, Joe. And uh, do you want to tell the people a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Cheers, Faz. Um, firstly, thank you very much for letting me be your first guest. I didn't know I was the first one. Um, <laughs> that's not too much of an onus to impress people. <laughs> um, I don't know if you made the right choice. It can only get better from here, let's just say that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so like Faz says, um, primarily I'm a coach. I work within like the physique, strength, health and performance world. I've been coaching for five years full-time. It's been my full-time profession for three years. Um, Started off creating the company JJ Physique that sort of expanded into a small team, which was the Optimal Physique Development guys, um, primarily with myself and Austin Stout, who's based in the US. I'm in the UK, like Faz. I'm down in Northampton, although all of my work is online. Um, I did primarily just work in the physique realm, like competitive, mostly bodybuilding. But from there, I now work with quite a few fighters, quite a few gen pop people on sort of larger health scales. Um, I work with a few different performance athletes, um, mostly fighters. And um, I work with all different physique competitors, females, men in all different classes and categories around the world. And um, yeah, that's pretty much what I do these days. Um, I don't know what else to say really. Yeah, I have a podcast, Optimal Physique Development Podcast, or the OPD Podcast. We kind of um, regret calling it Optimal Physique Development in a large way now, so we stick with um, OPD. Um, yeah, which has um, gone really well um, and has hopefully been useful to quite a lot of guys. Um, I, yeah, I love podcasting, so I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Faz. Awesome. Thanks very much. Just before we get on to the main topic, uh, you were talking about your range of clients. Did you mm. ever find any difficulty getting typecast towards a certain type of client? I remember early on when I was coaching, um, I got typecast into just working with competitive athletes. Um, but I, I actually really like working with Jump Up. What about you? Yeah, the sort of um, the, the problem was that the first client I ever had was a friend who was competing in his first bodybuilding competition. And I wasn't a coach at the time, but he... Uh, I'm, I'm quite like um like most coaches are like an extremely neurotic like individual that likes to really research and whatnot. And he just said like oh, you know all this stuff about um how to get lean or, or 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 drug use or whatever it may be. Can you help me out for this show? So I helped him out and I just put some photos online saying like you know look I helped this guy out. I didn't really think anything about it. And um, then I got inquiries from bodybuilders off the back of that. And um, and then I got inquiries from more bodybuilders off the back of them. You see how it how it rolls like that. And I ended up with a full client class of, of bodybuilders. So um, luckily, I began working with a friend of mine that's a fighter. Um, did some sort of work with his performance there. Um, did the old social media um, stuff. Luckily, my, um, my wife's a, a digital marketer, so she sort of taught me back when... Because when we first met was when I first started coaching full-time. Um, so she kind of helped me with the social media stuff, which as we know really is everything to get in business as a coach. And um, yeah, I got more sort of fighters off the back of that and then their friends that were gen pop and stuff. So yeah, luckily I, I managed to get out of it, but it is hard once you're in it to get out for sure. Yeah. Also, I, I should say congratulations on your recent wedding. So uh, all the best. Yeah. Fantastic. She can, she can probably hear yeah, this. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Right. So we'll start off with the first question. Now, this is a question I'm coming to with a completely open mind. I, I have my own opinions based on what I've done previously, but I am looking to get educated on it myself. So I thought we could bounce around some ideas. Um, so the topic is adherence. Now, to, to give everyone a, a bit of a background, I've, in terms of my coaching style up to date, up to now, I've tried to get people um, from A to B, whatever their destination is in the fastest, most efficient way and the safest way, you know, health-wise. Um, however, I'm, I'm starting to question whether there's, a, there's room for regular changes in, in a client's routine and protocols, specifically just to stimulate interest and increase adherence. 
So mm-hmm. not because it's going to provide any actual tangible benefit, but rather more of a psychological thing. Um, and an alternate perspective of when total adherence is probably not the best option uh, for certain clients. So I wanted to kind of bounce around some ideas. So to give you an example of one of the types of things I'm talking about, but it could be anything, is uh, varying uh, macros during uh, during the week. So rather than having something like a, a weekly average, varying macros across the week, and specifically doing that to stimulate interest and increase adherence rather than rather than any physiological or benefit. So uh, I wanted to know your thoughts thoughts on that. Okay, so I'll take your example there, varying macros through the week. So it's very likely that the rate of change that that is actually going to make is so minute that it couldn't even be tracked. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's going to be the average caloric intake throughout the week in reference to the goals is what's going to really matter. Um, but it comes back to the sort of main point of novelty and how humans react to it. Mm. I believe. So when somebody's paying for a coach, they want to feel like they're getting something like they're getting the secret. They're getting the, the, the ins and outs, the minutia, the, the, um, like, uh, deep details that, that most people don't have. And when they feel like they have that, they want to use it and they get excited about it and therefore they execute. Um, it's, I think it all comes back to novelty in that case and feeling like you're doing something that other people aren't or or you're doing something more complicated because it makes you feel like you're you're going faster than everybody else or you're getting this kind of secret. But in reality, they could eat the same calories every day and it would probably give them within 99% of the range of the exactly the same results. But they may not execute because they think, I could be doing this without a coach. He's just throwing me some calories. So the novelty is almost lost. Same thing with training. Me and Jazz were just talking about because Jeff Nippard's just put out a video either today or last night and we were just watching it over breakfast saying, um, um, discussing Cliff Wilson's point that um, bodybuilders put too much emphasis on the main power lifts. Um, But the point is is that there's a great novelty there because people get so hyped up to progress these lifts because they're so fun. Therefore, they execute the session with a greater level of intensity and adherence, like you say. Um, so, that's a great, yeah, that's a great example um, regarding the powerlifts uh, and the novelty. And I think there's a certain degree of exclusivity that people buy into. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's a good point you made about people getting excited about that because that's kind of what I see as well. So the changes typically stimulate more excitement and more buzz with those clients. So they'll stick up there on their Instagram stories about these little changes. Um, and that's kind yeah. of what got me thinking about it in the first place. So I'm, I wanted to sort of toss around a few ideas of what are things which perhaps you've done with your clients, uh, which were for this purpose or could you see being beneficial? Um, yeah. So to sort of like preface this, I'm sure you've seen it. I see it constantly, mostly with general population clients hmm. or very neurotic bodybuilders is they want changes in their check-ins every week. Yeah. Yeah, in, absolutely. In reality, a coach knows the best change is no change. Mm-hmm. If things are working, ticking over, leaving it is perfect. That's what you want. You don't want to have to touch programs all the time. If something's just working, you don't want to have to introduce adjustments. You want to eke out the last bit of results, but Clients don't like that. They'll feel, what am I paying for? Or they get all excited when they send their check-in, they're, you know, refreshing their emails all day because they want to see if they can add 20 grams of carbs to their intra workout shake or something. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it makes them feel like they're doing something when in reality it's such a minute thing behind laying down the big rocks that it's not going to make a difference. Absolutely, um, yeah. But, yeah, you're right. With, with some clients, you have to give them that novelty of change for them to remain adherent. Mm. Otherwise, if you're like, oh, I'm not doing anything here. I'm just going to, you know, whatever. Mm. So, yeah. I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'm, uh, I'm wondering if you've ever used any examples yourself. I mean, I've, I've not, so I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest with that. Um, I've not done anything like that, but I'm considering doing that with some gen pop clients and making it clear from the beginning, you know, what, what I'm doing. Um, oh, I do. I do have yeah. things like that. I have things where, um, for example, if I, I'm looking at my emails now and I've got a check-in, I'm sure he won't mind, um, from a client of mine called Dan. Um, he's a gem pop client. He doesn't compete, but when he, he came to me very obese, mm. he came to me at, if I remember correctly, 290 pounds, untrained. Um, 
He's now 175 pounds. So he's lost Brilliant. over 100. Yeah, he's, very, he's very lean. He's gained a lot of muscle and strength in the process. But he's someone that has to have something like, like ticking him over. So, for example, we have these two days of the week that are uh, a lot higher calories and a different macro split. And he has this kind of spike meal after his leg days, his two lower body days of the week. Um, and the other days are lower calorie. And he feels like that mentally that fuels him for his lower body days. And he gets excited for that. And he tells me, he feeds back, I train harder during my lower body days because I feel like I'm going to go out and eat a lot of food. So I feel like I have to earn it. Yeah. In reality, it doesn't make any difference. across me. It's just total energy intake. But mentally, it does something to him where he works harder. Therefore, intensity is greater. He's progressing faster. And the results come quicker. Other clients wouldn't be like that, that understand the sort of basic concept of thermodynamics and mm -hmm. whatnot. You know, so same thing with free meals. I've, I mean, free meals don't really have any physiological benefit, but I've used them in a similar way. Mm -hmm. For example, I'll just make the deficit bigger through the week, and then they'll have a similar free meal once or twice a week, whatever it is. And, they, and sometimes they'll, they'll tell me that they feel like they need to earn it when they're training, and it makes them train harder. Mm. But yeah, yeah. I, I have done that quite, quite a bit. But I avoid it if I can. Yeah. Um, I've, I've got a uh, study here uh, regarding placebo. Um, this is something that uh, Chester Rockwell brought to my attention on the forum that we, we are part of. Uh, it was uh, expectancy effects and strength training. Do steroids make a difference? Yes. So, I, I actually spoke to Jazz about this the other day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love this one. It's an interesting study, isn't it? So the, for the audience, the, the general gist of it was that um, – they had a, a coach, powerlifting coach, and a powerlifting team. And the powerlifting team were under the impression that they were taking steroids. These guys were all nationally ranked powerlifters. So they were very impressive in terms of strength. So to give you an idea, average body weight is roughly 85 kilos. Average maxes were roughly a 260 squat, a 207 bench, and a 260 deadlift. So it's, you know, very good numbers. Um, now, these guys are all nationally ranked powerlifters and all natural. So the... Uh, the coach got them thinking that he was giving them steroid pills, the entire team. In fact, they were just sugar pills. And they went to do a test, and every single one of them hit PRs. So these guys were hard training powerlifters, competitive guys. Um, but due to the power of placebo, due to the power of belief, they, they actually improved uh, their lifts. And this is really what got me thinking about adherence and, and these little tricks that, uh, that coaches are doing to stimulate interest. Now, for the client, the client, as long as they really believe in what they're doing, it provides some sort of benefit to them. So my question is, my next question is, if we are to implement these types of adherence uh, improvement changes, are we best off letting the client be aware of what we're doing? Or are we best off just saying, well, this is a change that you need to do um, and it's going to benefit you in this way? That, that's quite tough because I think that's a, a very much an ethical question. Absolutely. Um, it, there's, there's definitely an ethical moral element to it. Yeah. When I strip it back personally, I see my job as, as the coach to get the client. They're paying me to get them to where they want to be the fastest way possible yep. whilst maintaining a level of sound health. Um, mm. whatnot. So if I told them why I was implementing something that to be honest is probably not really making any difference. Mm then I'm almost eradicating that goal because then it ruins the reason that I'm putting it in there. Yeah. If I tell somebody, I'm going to put this in there because I think it's going to have a placebo effect, the placebo effect won't then exist. Yes. So really, uh, to be honest, I have never told a client when I've made these changes because it's for the greater good, but, you know, Kant would disagree. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should um, tell them. Um, but... Personally, I, I use that as a tool to increase, you know, to, to make their service better, what they're paying for at the end of the day. Absolutely. Yeah, that's it. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that we do as coaches, which the client might not necessarily understand why we do them. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all part of the service. Um, and, they, you know, they understand eventually, but it's all sort of part of the service initially. So, yeah, I think morally and ethically, I don't think there should be an issue with that. But on the at first glance, it possibly sounds that like they might be, but uh, I, I think it's a reasonable thing to do because, as you say, you would eradicate the benefit of that placebo. Yeah. So it, it works. It works due to the the client believing in it, uh, and I see it every day on on social media, which is really what piqued my interest. Um, awesome. Right now, 
what I wanted to kind of segue onto was um, the second topic. Um, now, I wanted to talk about industry fads mm -hmm. uh, and the psychology of those who looked into them uh, and this idea of buying into exclusivity. Now, I think um, lots of people uh, have done quite a good job of covering fads uh, on social media over the years. So, you know, buzzwords, scare tactics. I know uh, Marty McPhee and Austin Stout, they have the Mind Body podcast, uh, they covered that very recently. My boys. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, it was a good, good podcast. So a shout out to them. My, my interest rather than uncovering the fads is to talk about the psychology of people who fall for those fads. Um, now it's sort of somewhat related to there's, there's a definitely a, a population who are into, ex, who are into exclusivity and without being completely unfair to CrossFit, I think you could, you could target that sort of uh, population. Uh, it's no secret that we, a lot of people who are into CrossFit also tend to be into things like being gluten-free, organic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is quite sort of amusing. Like it, it almost seemed that there was a sort of a gluten-free Thanos uh, finger click in 2012 and half the world decided to be, uh, to have a gluten allergy. Uh, so I think there's, it'd be, it'd be interesting to talk about the, what is, what populations tend to fall for these fads. Okay. I find, in fact, it's funny because we were just discussing this as well this morning. I find it's usually either the novice bodybuilder in the, um, the natural world that wants something that doesn't, hasn't yet understood just quite the longevity of the sport and how slow things are going to come, hmm. especially for them as a natural. Natural, so yeah. I think deep down people understand that these things aren't really going to reap much reward, but they convince themselves that they will. Um, I mean, how many times, I mean, let's throw back to, you know, 2010, how many times we've seen people saying, I held so much more muscle because I can't extend during my cardio. Yeah. You're just telling yourself that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not true. Um, like you said, the CrossFit world, yes, most definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, it's hard to really segregate because I see it across all ranges, mm -hmm. but it's interesting what you say about the gluten-free thing. Because that that was a big one. Um, yeah, 2012. Everyone everyone was on it. I mean, we know that there are some metabolites of gluten that are like systemically inflammatory, but mm -hmm. it's, it's dose dependence and um, I think absolutely avoiding gluten at all costs, like a lot of people are doing, is is crazy. But I don't want to um, I don't want to segue too much. Yeah, and this is this is not a, a sort of a, a dropping the hammer on CrossFit, especially as you say, it is across mm -hmm. all. Uh, populations. It was just interesting to sort of look at that psychology, and I think, I think for me, it's summed up with exclusivity. Um, it's like you say, it, it's quite interesting. You said that they might be aware of it, but they do it anyway. I think there is a certain, there is a certain, but being aware of it, but doing it as it sort of a potentially makes them a part of an exclusive crowd. It's so exactly, it goes back to what I spoke about when we when we first started talking here was like where they feel like they're doing something that somebody else is to give them that edge. Yeah. Or, uh, or you often see it as a, I mean, there's a Facebook group that we're both in that's just like banging your head against the wall seeing some of the stuff in there. And it's very much about point of authority sometimes. Mm -hmm. Make, makes you an authority figure because you're doing something that they're not. It's like, you see it in the keto world a lot as well. Now, I don't want to like bash on keto, but, or, or veganism is, is the best example. Mm, yeah. Very, very much like a point of authority where I saw a vegan, um, physique athlete the other day post if you eat meat over christmas you're immature you're childish um, again they're, they're they're setting themselves as an authority figure an ethical authority figure like i'm better than you because i do this mm. it's what i think it makes people feel like when they get some bcaa's and like, I've got the head on you now. yeah yes yeah. yeah it's the sort of hashtag if you know you know kind of thing yeah, that's, uh, that, yeah, that's, what a, that's one of the most triggering hashtags there is. <laughs> so. the, the irony of this whole thing is most of these people haven't even got their big rocks lined up. Yeah. And, you know, if they were just consistently lifting heavy with, like, progression, consistently eating heavy, then they'd grow some new muscle. But they have to do these little, you know, mastering the minutia. Mm. And it, and it missed the point because I do honestly believe bodybuilding is extremely simple yeah. when you break it down. Like, you know, eat more, lift more, you'll grow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know? 
So let's let's uh, let's think about this. And so you've got someone who's listened to this podcast, and we're uh, we're talking about fads and the types of people who fall for fads uh, and increasing adherence. What what would be the what are the negatives? What are the downfalls of someone? So what's the problem with someone? You know, being wanting exclusivity uh, is is there is there a downfall to that? Is there is there a, um, a setback? Well, firstly, you're going to end up extremely disappointed at the other end when it does nothing. If if you're an individual that can quantify results like that, um, your wallet's going to get a lot thinner. So again, you know, you're you're putting money where it could be elsewhere. It could be on food, which is going to serve you much better than any amino acids are. Um, and I think ultimately you get caught spinning your wheels over the minutia so much that you never really get anywhere. Um, because you're never just consistent with one thing for long enough, I find in these people. Um, you're just looking for the next thing, then the next thing, then the next thing. Instead of just laying down years of, like I said, the basics. I think, uh, I think as well, it, a lot of these fads, they like the gluten-free or organic, they tend to try and simplify a complex topic. Um, mm -hmm. So something like, learning about your macros by the time you've learned about your macros and you learn the interplay of say intra workout nutrition and all that type of stuff the stuff which actually matters it you tend to then look at gluten-free and organic uh, uh these types of fads as as a little bit pointless because you you actually know what actually makes a difference i tend to think that with a lot of these fads there you get the exclusivity part of it but also it it seeks to simplify a topic which doesn't really it can't really be simplified. So in, in focusing exclusively on fads, you're sort of missing the big picture of, like you're saying, laying the big rocks. And it perhaps waterproofs their minds to learning about actual nutrition. Right. Yeah, exactly. I see, I see that in quite a lot of uh, people that I talk to about, about some of these things. Uh, they're very, very happy to, to go on about fads like this, different things that they type and eat, which are mostly irrelevant in regards to performance nutrition. Uh, but then they don't really, they don't really have enough time or energy or inclination afterwards to actually learn about the nutrition that matters. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, agree with that totally. Okay, brilliant. All right, right. So I think we've had a, a good chat about adherence, good chat about sort of psychology of people and, and some of the, the downfalls and the pitfalls. While we're here, and while we've got a bit of time, I wanted to get your uh, opinion on on a separate topic. This is, a, this is completely different. I was talking to someone recently he's a natty and he's uh he's pretty much on the nose in terms of how big he's going to be um he's, he's right there um now you and i were big fans of uh of sort of heavy off seasons mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, we, we talked about the satirati video recently where he talked about just eating a lot in the off season and getting and getting a little bit soft mm -hmm. um in terms of say particularly the natty population if they're reaching that point where they say six foot weigh 100 kilos they're, they're pretty much they're starting to max out on the the amount of muscle on their frame would you recommend something like a heavy bulk to force the gains is there a benefit to that or is it a case of if they do a heavy bulk it's just gonna have to be dieted off later actually surprisingly no mm. in the natural in, in in the in the population group that you speak about no because i haven't got the manipulation over over their specific nutrient partitioning capabilities mm. um i mean we know if, I mean, Lyle has done a brilliant breakdown of how much muscle tissue can be accrued under optimal conditions in natural athletes. Mm -hmm. By the time they're reaching their peak, it's pretty much immeasurable. Mm -hmm. It's something, it's going to be around less than a pound per year mm -hmm. under optimal conditions. Um, so essentially what I've found in experience of getting those people to sort of bulk heavy is their blood glucose just goes up, nutrient partition goes down more nutrients going to the fat cell uh, because they're just capped at the amount of skeletal muscle tissue that they can add at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I'm assuming this person has been progressively overloaded in, in the gym for years, um, you know, has added a good maybe 30 pounds of tissue and really is at the, at the, at the peak of what they could do naturally. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I probably wouldn't advise um, SAS style <laughs> off season. <laughs> Day. because I, I just think it would have a, a negative return that uh, uh, this is assuming they're not off the back of like running extremely low cows for a long time or something no um, no th this this lad in particular who i'm talking about who i, I think he represents at least uh, some of the populations that i've worked with I, I know another client who's similar to him 
uh, he's effectively just been training for strength for quite a long time. Um, yeah. And so he's been pushing the poundages. He's actually very strong and competes in the power for as well. Um, and he, he does physique uh, competitions every now and again. Um, so yeah, you, you probably, you'd just say at that stage, you're pretty much maxed out. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I wouldn't advise it. I, th I don't think the return would be as positive. I mean, the, like, to be, to be honest, I know people that use drugs like to downplay it, but the effect of, of performance enhancing drugs on nutrient partitioning is huge. Yeah. I mean, if I have a client using a good dose of testosterone, a solid dose of growth hormone and insulin, I'm really like, they're just not getting fat. Mm -hmm. They're just yeah. not. No matter if I'm pounding them, eating to the point of being sick, mm -hmm. uh, if we're keeping their nutrient partitioning where it should be, they're just, you know, they're taking on a lot of bloat um, in some cases and lower backs pumping up, just walking up the stairs, but they're not gaining actual new body fat if yeah. we're keeping their nu nutrient partitioning high. But you're right that others are natural, so. Mm. And yeah, there I think cases, There are cases, and I'll give you a very easy example for me. Um, which is more interesting because in a female. So um, my wife, Jazz, coming off the back of her competition, was like, she was maybe eight weeks into the off-season, still hadn't got menstrual cycle function back. Um, training was dragging, wasn't enjoying training. Um, so we sort of flipped it on its head and had her gain quite a significant amount of new body fat for her. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think she's like, what, he's like 30 pounds up or something? Yeah, 20. 20 pounds up. So that's a lot of body fat to gain off the bat for a female. But straight away, menstrual cycle function came back, mm -hmm. improved, and the progressive overload in the gym is now flying. But that was because of the previous state. So mm -hmm. we, had, we, we had to do that. For, for a but if we're talking this natty is, is off-season, a reasonable body fat already, already pushing, you know, a surplus and... Yeah, the return's probably going to be negative. Nick caps off. Yeah, I, I think so, yeah. And I think he's precisely the kind of guy who probably would benefit from, uh, you know, jumping on and being enhanced uh, because with his level of knowledge and commitment to the sport, I think he could do, uh, do really great things. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Awesome. Right, I've exhausted my list of uh, questions uh, for today, ones that I want to ask. So uh, unless we've got anything else, I think we can, uh, we can call it that. Yeah, sweet. That's when you. I'm happy with with whatever, man. That was, awesome. Uh, That's good. Little, um, not too bad. I pretty much just woke up. We had like a twelve hour sleep last night. <laughs> nice. That's <laughs> <laughs> what the weekends are for. Uh, but yeah, no. Cheers. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it, and we've had a nice chat. Um, so yeah, I will. Uh, I will continue to to put out some podcasts and, and work on my hosting. Uh, this is the first time I've ever host um, <laughs> someone, so. Uh, we'll see what kind of feedback I get. But... You're better than me, and I've done. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, really, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, thanks a lot. So, um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see you soon. And you, Jazz. See you later. Cheers, Take man. Care. Yeah, my pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks very much. Cool. Uh.